Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Beautiful, sunny Missoula day. How is everybody? Is food okay? All right, they do a nice job for us. Um, I want to welcome everyone to the 30th annual State of Missoula, sponsored by the Missoula Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we got a great program in front of you today. It's called Opportunities to Meet Community Goals. What can we afford and what can we not afford to pass up? Um, I'll be your MC today. Uh, my name is Nick Kaufman. I'm a land use planner with the engineering firm of WGM Group here in Missoula and uh, have the honor of being the chairman of the Missoula Area Chamber of Commerce this year. Um, with that, I'd like to ask Gene Curtis to stand up and we'll start the festivities with the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. All right. A uh, few noted people in the audience. We have two county commissioners here today. We have Commissioner Rowley and Commissioner Curtis way over there, sort of in the middle back. We've got a table with uh, John Ingen and some of our city council members and uh, our new public works director, John Wilson. You can see the back of his head there, Mr. Distinguished. Yeah, there he is right there. Welcome to Missoula, John. And up here at the head table, we've got some boards of directors and uh, John Kathis from Mountain Water Company and uh, David Pashika from Liberty Utilities is with us today. Anybody I'm missing out in, in this fine audience? All right, thank you very much. So what is the Chamber of Commerce and what do we do? The Chamber of Commerce is about one thing. It's about keeping business healthy. Now what happens when we have healthy businesses is those businesses support our wonderful nonprofits in Missoula. And what do our nonprofits do? Our nonprofits are the gatekeepers for our quality of life. Those things that make Missoula so special that differ differentiate Missoula in many markets and make it a great place. Working together then, healthy businesses and nonprofits create a value for a community. It's a value that we all see. And it's a value that outside people see for Missoula too. So that's the Chamber of Commerce. Who in, who in the world are the board of directors for the Missoula Area Chamber of Commerce? What do they think about? Um, are they a bunch of conservative sort of individuals? Or they, or they reflect really the goals and values of Missoula? And I'll tell you that the Missoula Area Chamber of Commerce board of directors reflects the goals and values that you see in this room, that you see reflected every day uh, in what comes out of a good portion of government policy. Laval Means, who's with us today, is going to talk about the growth policy, came to one of our board meetings. And there were 15 boards of director members there, and she asked a question. She said, what's the most important thing, the single most important thing about Missoula to each of you? And as she went around the room, eight out of 15 members of that board of directors said, parks, recreation, or trails. We also supported the last mountain lion mill levy. Let's talk about Missoula. You're in the best 100 communities for young people. That's from Inc. Magazine. You're the number one place to pursue the American dream from site selection. You're the second best city in America for doing business outside magazine. You're the fifth best average commute time, U.S. Census. U of M, fifth most road scholars among public universities. One of six communities selected by Google to help businesses get on the map. Sixth best river town in America, Outside Magazine, and number eight top cycling city in the U.S. You can applause. <laughs> nice work. That means that there's leadership in Missoula, but it also means there's teamwork. Individual commitments to a group effort that is what makes a team work, a company work, a society work, and a civilization work. Vince Lombardi. 
Teamwork is the ability to work together toward a common vision, the ability to direct individual accomplishments towards organizational objectives. It is the fuel that allows common people to attain uncommon results, Andrew Carnegie. So that's why you're a great community. That's why you're in the top 100. Right? That's why Missoula is a great place. But Missoula is a great place for lots of conversations, and a lot of times those conversations are individual conversations, and they're not conversations that we have as a group of people, right? So we got one group of people talking about one thing over here and another group talking about something over there. So some of the individual conversations in our community right now include parks and trails. We just passed a $43 million bond issue, the largest recreation bond issue, I think, in the state or history of Montana. High schools and elementary schools are coming up. The library, uh, perhaps another open space bond issue. Public safety and justice. We all know about the issues at the University of Montana over the past years and what's happened in our court system and the upgrades that both our city and county have made uh, to address those challenges. The county detention center was in the news just last week, right? And what's going on at the detention center and what we need to do to upgrade the excuse me, the detention center uh, will be on our radar. Cities talk about a new ladder fire truck. They don't come cheap. A conversation about broadband in our community is a strong conversation right now. And then, of course, the purchase of Mountain Water Company. The challenge, then, is for all of us to be informed on community goals, community issues, community opportunities, and community resources if we want to take advantage of the opportunities. So <clears throat> to define community goals, uh, John Levy, who's a project manager with the Snorin Institute, will talk to us about place value. Laval Means, who's with the Development Services uh, for Missoula County and working on the update of the growth policy, will also talk to us, as will James Grunke, who's the uh, CEO and head of MEP. So these people will talk to us, and their job is to inform us on what our community goals and objectives are. Okay? So with that, John, why don't you start to prepare? And I'd like to introduce, why don't you come on up here? Stand right anywhere you'd like. So John Levy was at Ravalli County for a while. How many people got to interface with John down there? He tells me he was not responsible for the fact they now have five county commissioners instead of three. That, that happened later. All right. So John is a land use planner out of the Sonoran Institute's Bozeman, Montana office. John is the former planning director in Ravalli County, Montana, and has worked on a wide variety of community planning, transportation, and land use projects. John works with community partners throughout the Northern Rockies to advance community development, economic development, and conservation and development goals. And John's going to talk to us about their recent survey and place value. John. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Nick, for that introduction. And thank you, everyone, for showing up today. Thanks to the Chamber for putting on this great event. Can you all hear me OK? Just, just nod if you, if you can. Um, so I'm excited to be here today. I'm excited to share some of the results of our recent research. Nick alluded to place value. I'll also uh, introduce later on some uh, findings from some other research we've done over the past couple years. And, you know, I'm excited to share this with you all today because I look out at you all today and I see a lot of faces that are doing a lot of good for this community. And the role that you all play in this community really can't be overstated. What you're doing from an investment perspective, from a strategy perspective, um, is crucial. And it's helping Missoula become the place that it's going to be. And, you know, at the end of the day, this community needs you. It needs your vision. It needs your leadership. Because from that economic development perspective, um, you know, it's just crucial what you all are doing. So thank you for that. And from that, that perspective, you know, some of the work that we've done with communities um, has shown us that there's always interest in what communities can do to be more effective in their economic development approaches. And so this recent research, Place Value and some of these, these other studies, have really come about after we started to ask ourselves some questions. What might we do to help inform those discussions? And what kind of questions might we ask to add some value to, to these ongoing discussions? 
Um, because, you know, communities around the West, they were interested in, in learning about this. And they had said, you know, sometimes some of these traditional approaches don't necessarily work for us, or maybe we're struggling sometimes, and are there some things that we can do that might work better for our community? So our, our research really is an attempt to add some value to those, those conversations. So before I, I jump into the results, I think it's just important to talk a little bit about context. And, you know, one of the things that we learned of many from our great recession was the value, the importance of building strong and resilient and diverse local economies. And I think that in the West we can understand this because a lot of our communities sort of grew up around a single industry. A lot of our economies grew up around a single sector. And I think we're, we're just sensitive to, to the fact that that's, that's happened to us. Um, you know, and, and that did a lot to provide a strong economic base for, for many communities. But we're seeing some struggles emerge as these industries taper off. And as, you know, technologies advance, as markets change, as consumer preferences evolve. And so I've started to think about this in terms of, you know, an investor in the stock market who understands one of the cardinal principles of investment, which is you diversify your portfolio. You're starting to see a lot of communities think along these lines. It's also important to acknowledge that when we think about the West, there are a lot of circumstances that are particular to us. You look at this map, it's obviously our country, and you see these areas that are very lit up. And these are our large cities, our large metropolitan regions. And we happen to occupy this beautiful dark space in the middle. And it's a great place to be, there's, there's no doubt. Um, but it creates some challenges. I mean, when you, when you look at this map, we simply don't have the economic gravity that some of these other places do from a business density standpoint and from a population standpoint. So, you know, challenging as this may be, there are also some opportunities that come from this. Um, you know, we, we know, we live here, we know the quality of life that living in the West affords. And for many decades, the West has been one of the fastest growing regions in the nation. Um, we expect that growth to continue. And so some of the opportunity we're seeing has to do with the emergence of these businesses that have the ability to plug into the global economy from, from anywhere, you know, where there's great internet speeds. Some people are calling these businesses location neutral businesses for reasons that I'll get to sort of later on in this presentation. At the Sonoran Institute, we're starting to refer to this as a lifestyle. We're calling it the mobility lifestyle. And, you know, this is because not only do we now possess the technology to allow this un untethering from place, but we're also learning that people just really like having that freedom. It's very important. And it has a lot of implications for what our communities will grow up to be. So, so people are becoming more mobile. Technology has become an enabling agent to allow that mobility um, that allows workers to plug in. And, you know, you're starting to see places notice this too. You guys all read about what Phillipsburg is, is working on. Um, Phillipsburg isn't alone. You know, a lot of communities are recognizing the growth of this Im increasingly important knowledge-based economy where you're able to create jobs, where you're able to create wealth, really based on our ability to think, our, our analysis, our design, our creativity. It's our, our creative capital. And um, it's a hugely important economic shift. It's, it's, it's so important. Some are starting to say that this might have implications in terms of our nation in the same way that the Industrial Revolution did all those years ago. Um, so just to give you some perspective on that, we'll rewind to 1900 when you look at the overall complexion of the American economy. And it was driven primarily by agriculture. About 50% of our economy was generated through agriculture. Fast forward now to today where we've got 35% of our nation which is invested in this, this knowledge-based um, sector. So I point this out to you to say that things are happening, things are changing, we, we uh, can likely see these changes continue to happen and they do have the potential to shift not only communities in America but right here in Missoula. Um, so, so these changes, you know, they're helping to drive some, some evolutions and some adap adaptations in the field of, of economic development. And I put this slide up here 
you know, not to tell you that economic development has up and gone in a completely new direction, <laughs> nor to tell you that some of these, you know, traditional, these then approaches are obsolete. That's not the case. Um, but what we are saying is that, you know, what we're learning, what we're finding is that that toolbox is expanding. And there are new tools that are coming to the fore that can be an enhancement that can be um, married to some of these traditional uh, tools that will work. Um, so you think about some of those traditional approaches and, and you, you, know, you see communities doing things to attract the next big uh, business to their area. We're going we're gonna to land Boeing. Boeing's going to be here next. And um, oftentimes this is referred to as elephant hunting and was sort of revolving around this mantra of we're open for business. Well, you see this working really successfully in some places. Uh, Magic Valley in Idaho, it's being called the Magic Miracle. This approach has worked really well for them. But it doesn't work equally well in all communities. So you're starting to see communities say, OK, maybe we're not going to land that next elephant, but what can we do to grow jobs from within? What can we do to look at ourselves from the inside and foster growth internally? So you're starting to hear now more about economic gardening and workforce development and um, you know, entrepreneurship and creativity and doing all these things that looks at your existing intrinsic talent in your community and helps to prop and grow that from within. So the work that we've done through our recent research has really focused on these, these, these newer, these emerging tools. And if I were to summarize in as, as tight a nutshell as I can, what our research has focused on, it's been really what are the factors that attract this mobility lifestyle, these businesses, talent, entrepreneurship to our region. So to get at some of the roots of this question, um, and this is the place value study, we developed two different surveys that we then disseminated to Colorado, Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana. We worked with um, business partners, we worked with Chambers of Commerce, thank you Sam, um, economic development um, authorities, business partners to get the survey out there. And we heard from 476 businesses representing 60 different communities in our region, including from right here in Missoula. And the businesses ran the gamut from manufacturing to retail to services, really all points in between. Our survey of community members generated 494 um, individual responses. And um, that represents 70 different communities, again, including from right here in Missoula. So from these surveys, what did we learn? We learned that it appears that jobs follow people. So we asked business owners why they chose a particular community as a place to start a business. And for most business owners, uh, actually 70% of our respondents said that they didn't move to their current community specifically for the purpose of opening a business but instead they moved to a community that they wanted to live in and started a business at a later time. So people are moving to places they want to go to. So why are people moving to places they want to go to? Well, people are drawn to great places is, is something we found. Our results indicate that the overall quality of a community is one of the driving factors that attracts people to a community. And so here are the results of our surveyed um, uh, community members, and you can see overall quality of the community rises right to the top in this list. And for our business community, uh, again, you can see overall quality of the community is a significant force for many of these people to go to a new community. Now, I want to draw your attention to a couple things in this, um, this chart here. You can see favorable zoning regulations, favorable tax structure, availability of business incentives. Clear that they're still important. But they don't rise to the level of, of overall quality of community in this, um, for that question. So when we think about business incentives, when we think about favorable tax policies, um, it's true that in our survey they didn't rise to the top in terms of what's attracting people to communities. But when we came back and asked what could make your community more business friendly, they did mention these types of things. Very, very important. So I bring this to your attention to say that we view this as a both and scenario where you need to both do what you can to invest in your community, to invest in your place, to make it be as attractive and alluring as it can be, and do what you can from a policy perspective, from a regulatory perspective, from a taxing perspective to create that business climate that keeps 
those businesses in your community. So we're seeing in our region that, I mean, people on the move are seeking great places. We ask people, okay, if this is true, what is more important to you? Is your job more important or is the community more important? And we found that over 40% of our respondents consider both pretty much equally. But of the remainder, um, people tend to lean, toward, lean towards community. This point is underscored by our findings related to salary, where um, we found that people are willing to live in their ideal community even if it means they're paid a little bit less. So our question was, you know, would you rather choose to live in a community that's your ideal community where you're paid a little bit less, or would you rather live in a less than ideal community but get paid a little bit more? And people said, well, overwhelmingly, we'd rather live in our ideal community, even if it means we're paid a little bit less. So in those points being told, you know, one of the key findings for us is that place has value. It's an overarching principle of, of our findings here. And the role of creating great communities is really something that can be folded more directly into overall economic development strategies. And it, you know, at this point, it might be one of these no dumb moments, but we're finding that when we work with communities, community development and placemaking really aren't folded chiefly into local or regional economic development strategies. But the results of the study really, really point to the importance of creating great places that are attractive to business, that are attractive to entrepreneurs, that attract that talent you need as, as being a successful component of a larger economic development strategy. So let's talk a little bit about what quality community is because that's, that's a pretty important point here. Um, you know, how do you know what that looks like? What are the factors that make up a quality community? This is where I'll start to introduce some of our other research we've done. We've done a report we called Reset, which looks at housing and neighborhood choices. We did a report called Restore, which looks at commercial and retail market trends. So I'm going to pull from those two studies um, over these next couple, couple of slides here. So what is it that people want? What did we learn? We learned that, well, one factor is character and sense of place. We learned that 89% of our respondents prioritize neighborhood character over home size, and that's a significant decision uh, to locate or remain in a community. We learned that walkability and the ability to get out and about in your town is very important. 90% of our respondents said that they would prefer to live within walking distance of community destination decisions. That's important in their decision for where to locate, where to buy a house. Um, sort of going off this point, convenience and access to amenities are important. We learned that 58% of our respondents said they would buy a house if it were closer to those amenities and those social gathering spots that they enjoy. 42% said that they would, um, would, would rather live on larger lots in larger houses, even if it meant they had to log more time behind the wheel. Access to open space and recreation are key. Again, we heard here that more home buyers would make trade-offs on lot size, on housing density, if it meant they had access and could walk to parks and recreation and open space. We learned that transportation choices are important as well, with people voicing a pretty clear preference for a wide range of transportation options. Um, in our survey, 90% of the people felt that it was important, again, to be able to walk to places and have the infrastructure to be able to get there. It's not just the proximity, it's the, the provision of physical access. And 57% of that same group, this is a non-forced choice question for the survey geeks in the room, said that um, living near transportation was important if it were available uh, public transit. Safety and privacy are also key considerations. 87% of our respondents said that a safe community was very important to them. 47% felt that privacy from their neighbors was also very important. Authenticity and sense of community. People like knowing that they live in a community and they feel that places that offer an authentic sense of engagement um, and offer opportunities for that kind of engagement are very important to them. We heard that 54% of people um, prefer living in neighborhoods and communities that offer some sort of community um, events. So again, I mean, these are some of the factors that contribute to the quality of a community. Um, you know, I'll say that I'm, I'm talking here from about the 30,000 foot perspective. So what I want to encourage you to do is think about these at this point as principles, not prescriptions. 
But, you know, you recognize that not every community in the West, much less the nation, is going to bag that next elephant. Uh, there are some strategies that, that you can do to help provide that, that sense of place and authenticity that people are looking for. So I've got to run through this list, and it's, it's, it's redacted. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'm happy to give you our, our studies afterwards. But here's a few of our key findings. One, one is placemaking. Is this a term anybody's heard of? I'm sure it's becoming a little more ubiquitous. You know, in a nutshell, what placemaking is, it's the thoughtful pursuit of building places for people that provide that authentic sense of place and engagement. Um, it has a lot to do with creativity. It has a lot to do with design. It has a lot to do with scale. Another strategy, um, being strategic with your investments. Public funds are limited. We know that. And um, being very careful about where you put your funds is, is important. It has a lot to do with asking the question, what do we want to be as a community? And where, where do we want to go in our future? And what does that look like? And then being able, through your capital planning and investments process, to be able to align those resources to create the places that you think are going to be attracting the kind of business, the kind of talent, the kind of entrepreneurship you want to draw into your community. Transportation systems are so important, and you know we encourage um, you to think of them not only as connections between places, but as components of place. The more we learn about walkability and the more we learn about what that term means, the more it becomes clear that how people are enabled to move around their community bears a pretty direct relationship with their sense of quality of that place. And finally, the role of partnerships, uh, very crucial. can't really be overstated. We see communities experiencing success when they cultivate relationships and partnerships with the people that are needed to get things done. And this doesn't mean you have to agree on every nitty gritty piece of detail. But you can understand some key principles, some key concepts that help set the stage for those kinds of discussions to happen. So I'm going to wrap it up. And I would just say that you know, at the end of the day, we're finding that it no longer just makes sense to hang their proverbial help wanted sign in the window of your community and broadcast to the world that you're open for business, there's no community is closed. What we're finding is that what also makes sense is to broadcast to the world that you're open for a community and that you're open for place. This is what people are looking for. So I think with that, my time is up. Thank you all very much for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you. You all thought he was talking about Missoula. He was, <clears throat> excuse me, talking about a, a much broader region. A couple of things that John, <clears throat> excuse me, talked about that I want to emphasize is a strategy moving forward. In this segment, we're trying to help you understand, recognize what our community goals are. And so John has given you a, sort of a touchstone of the goals and objectives of communities within our region, but also Missoula. And we have limited resources. And Pat, later on in the presentation, Pat Barkey is going to talk to us about the limited resources. Uh, and I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the things that are, that are opportunities for us coming up. Um, we will have a question and answer period. Uh, and I want you to think about this as the speakers uh, talk, because I know that was a pretty stimulating conversation. First time I saw it uh, on a webinar, I had a lot of questions uh, for John, and some of which he's answered for us today. And then we'll have a table exercise. Uh, one of the things the Chamber of Commerce does in, in our role is to help inform our members and inform the community on what's going on and what the opportunities are. And we're going to have forums after the state of Missoula as a function of which of those opportunities you folks want more information on. Um, you talked a little bit about the quality of life tax and those of us that live in uh, Missoula, John, I think are all aware of that. Um, I read recently, though, and I can't remember where I read it, and Val, you might remember and can speak to it in one of our economic focus groups, perhaps, that, that while at one time we had a very wonderful quality workforce, uh, right now our unemployment rate is 3%, which means we're kind of in a workforce shortage. Uh, what's happening is what I think we all knew was happening, that other communities are competing for our fine labor force, and people are starting to migrate out of Missoula. So I wonder right, how powerful that willingness to keep paying that quality of life tax is. I hope it's a great magnet, and I hope the opportunities in front of us uh, will, will help 
uh, regain and reestablish the quality workforce that we had some time back. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who's Laval Means, Laval Kimono. Laval, you work with the uh, City of Missoula and the newly created Development Services. Uh, you're the manager of Development Services, right? And you've been with City County for 18 years, Planning I think. Manager? Yeah. Planning well, manager. I don't know what it, whatever, whatever it says here. Um, so I've worked with you for 18 years, and you you have an architectural background. You have a degree from MSU, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. John comes from that part of the, the country also now with his current job. It also says you have a master's degree from the University of Oregon. Go Ducks! Did you want to? Yeah, what happened with Ohio? Did you want to say anything I, about I that? Can't go ahead. <laughs> All right. She's especially blessed to call Missoula her home, where she is close to her husband's family. Her emphasis during her education, along with her interest, focused on understanding how a sense of place and community identity can be enhanced through a built environment. Do you see a theme coming through here, all of you? I see former city councilors uh, smiling over that way. She enjoys working with the community and sees the opportunity of updating the city of Missoula growth policy as a way to establish a direction for this community as it considers our identity and looking forward while also moving us forward through new city goals and actions. You're going to give us a sneak preview of the growth policy. Thank you, Laval. Laval Means. Thank you so much for having me here. I am going to describe for you the key community goals that are being developed in the process which we call Our Missoula which is essentially a city community plan for guiding growth and development for the next 20 years. It's called our Missoula because it's very important that this be a reflection of our community. And we started this project back in June of last year and have been engaged in discussions with community members and listening to people as they talk about things that they value in our community so much so that they would like to see that preserved or maintained as we grow and change um, over time and the challenges that we're facing that need to be addressed over time. So these are the main things that we've heard both as values and challenges over that last um, six months or so. And all this information in more detail actually is being forwarded to the to six focus groups that we've set up in this process. And just to point out that the focus groups are actually community members that are volunteering their time to help us work through the goal statements, the action items for the uh, plan, the objectives. And um, so it really is um, a key way of making sure that this is a reflection of what we're hearing from the community and the community members. The focus groups um, are, as, I, as this shows, are highlighted in six different topics and they're sorted in a way to be able to get at the, the, the things that are important in our community, the things that are a reflection of our community and essentially you know, come together to be the aspects of what it takes to live in a community. So what I'm going to do next is um, highlight the goals and themes that are being considered from each of those groups. I want you to keep in mind that uh, they're only about two-thirds of the way through and so this is still a work in progress and um, some evolution is uh, expected as we keep working on it. So to start with uh, economic health. <laughs> This is the first set of goals. Uh, goals are being developed that generally support business retention, expansion, and relocation to Missoula. The focus is also on the need to support the um, workforce through more emphasis on training, resources, and alignment with education systems. Entrepreneurs are also a big part of the economy. Since we know that about 90% of the workers in Missoula are um, employed by businesses that are 20 employees or fewer. And as the past presentation pointed out, a big part of the um, consideration of what brings people to Missoula, what keeps us living in Missoula, and supports and attracts, can attract new jobs, is that essence of quality of life and consideration of the uh, having appropriate housing and amenities and supportive quality of life to attract new businesses and employees. 
So moving on to community systems, there we have a focus that is really primarily on the relationships between development and our infrastructure systems, like our streets, our trails, our transit, our sewer, and, and also broadband. There we are also seeing goals that are, are being developed that have to do with encouraging new development that can occur in the direction of our existing infrastructure so that we're doing more to make better use of the services that we have. So a focus group on housing um, is addressing issues regarding supply of housing and, and housing types for all people especially recognizing changing demographics with the aging population. They're also acknowledging the need to have greater access to affordable and safe housing for the homeless and the impermanently housed. This group is looking at ways to support housing that is close to community systems our and our local services and amenities like parks and small neighborhood commercial areas. They're looking at ways that we can think about mixing uses more so that services are um, within proximity and also ways that we can maybe tie into some of our transportation systems like transit in a better way. <coughs> Livability and quality, li quality of life is focusing on ways to plan for growth while honoring our unique characteristics and our sense of place. There we see goal statements that are intended to capture that sense of place in things like our historic and cultural resources and a focus on the arts as well. They're also looking at ways to recognize that connection to the great outdoors if you saw from the earlier slide about the values and as Nick mentioned even you know in many of our conversations that connection to our um, parks, our open space, and our natural resources is a big part of uh, what we value and what we want to honor in the future. The emphasis on environmental quality is on focusing on the clean and healthy environment through goals that address things like clean air, um, improved water quality, improved soil quality also. But they're looking at ways to think about our future in um, developing goal statements that have to do with promoting energy efficiency and green building practices and conservation. And then finally, the, uh, the, the last theme or organization and perspective is on safety and wellness. This is addressing issues that regarding our health and security of our community by supporting the well-prepared and responsive emergency and disaster preparedness systems. Goal work is also being developed in consideration of our personal health and safety through supporting a wide range of social service needs and overall consideration of supporting a healthy environment for all. So in general, you'll see that um, there are interfaces between many of these different goals and the, and the topics in the different groups. And we're working through those interfaces and recognizing that, that um, what you might say and how you develop um, direction in uh, one particular aspect of our community certainly does help and affect other aspects of our community. The planning process really touches on pretty much all aspects that has to do with living here in Missoula. So to learn more and see how this project is developing, we are planning a community gathering uh, sometime in April. By then we'll have a more developed series of the objectives and the ideas for actions on how to implement the, the goals that are, are coming from this process. And then we'll be wrapping up this process later in the fall with um, the uh, project needing to go to planning board and then city council for their review and consideration. So please check also our website and that's one way that you can see where we're at on this process. Um, all the information from the focus groups gets loaded up there and advertisements for any new meetings that are coming up. We'll also broadly advertise the community meeting in April. And that website is www.ourmissoula.org. It's pretty easy to remember. Um, I hope that you uh, get a chance to check it out and that you check in on this process at intervals as we keep going. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Laval. I really appreciate that. Um, common themes. Um, you talked about sense of place. You talked about preserving what is authentic. John also talked about preserving what's authentic. 
we need to preserve what makes us unique as, as we move forward um, to become successful in community and in economic development. Those are really important. Um, you talked about, John, you talked about making good use of our resources and good decisions moving forward to meet our goals and objectives. And the value you also talked about making better use of our existing services in that. So, two snapshots about community goals and objectives. Write your questions down for later. And then make a note of what you agree with in terms of how you would like to see Missoula move forward in terms of what you heard. And do participate, please, uh, in our growth policy update. With that, I'd like to introduce Mr. James Grunke. He probably doesn't need an introduction, but I'm going to give him one anyway. Come on up, James. James is the CEO and has been the CEO since May of 2012 and has worked over 20 years leading and guiding economic development. Come on right up here, don't be shy. Okay. He's worked in the Western USA and began his involvement with Missoula economic development efforts as early as 2010. At that time, he was a project director with the National Community Development Services as a consultant with the NCDS and through previous work with economic development organizations. Grunke has experience in working with both nonprofits and government economic development organizations. He attended the University of Idaho and received his master's degree in public affairs from Boise State University and now is very proud with his involvement in the economic partnership for Missoula. Mr. James Grunke. Thanks, Nick. And Kim and Nick, thank you for inviting me to speak today. It's always a, a pleasure. Um, I've always so impressed by the turnout that Missoulians have, whether it be to the chamber event or the economic uh, summit that Pat does. It means this community cares about their community and they're interested in what's happening. And I can tell you that someone who works on behalf of the community, it makes me very proud to be a part of the community. So thank you for your, your interest here. I've also noticed whenever you have panels, um, there seems to be a weaker link at one of the speakers. After listening to the previous two presentations, I know which role I'm going to have here. So um, I'm going to talk really briefly about what we're up to and try to pose some questions, what we're thinking about in economic development. Um, I was happy to see in John's slide about the new way of economic development. We were in the new category, what we're doing here. So we must be doing some things right. The other thing that we are, which button are we pushing? Oh, uh, this one is turned on up here, and then that'll take okay. you forward. So who are we? We're a private sector-led economic development group. We're a private-public partnership, or if the mayor was speaking, it's a public-private partnership. Um, we have over 100 businesses that are, are investors in ours, but we also have over 30 strategic partners. These are the people that are key for us to be successful. The Chamber of Commerce is one of our strategic partners. The Montana World Trade Center is one of our strategic, strategic partners. Those are the things that make us successful. Um, that's a little blurry. I'm sorry that it's hard to see. And what do we do? We really as a resource for companies to accelerate their growth. That's what we're all about. And we do it really by several different things. First and foremost, we put our efforts on business retention and expansion. A lot of communities pay lip service to this, but when we went out and we were created, we asked Missoulians, what is the important value that you want to see of your economic development activity? And it was, what are you doing to help existing businesses grow and expand? And that's what we do. We spend a lot of time on business startups. That's our second wave. It's easier. We have people that are here now that they want to grow or start a business. And so we spend a lot of time working with business startup and entrepreneurship. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a key to our economic growth. And key to that is a partnership with the University of Montana and the faculty and the students and what they're doing. And, and Brent Campbell this morning sent me an article from the Seattle Times about a local company called um, Sunburst Sensors that's competing in a global competition on, sorry, my writing was a little bad this morning, on ocean health with their sensors. And if they win, it's a $750,000 prize. This is a company that's founded and started in Missoula, started by a, a University of Montana professor and is growing and is really interesting. And I think it's something for us to keep our eyes on. So we really try to be aware of what's happening in the startup industries. <clears throat> Business attraction. Um, these are our actual flyers of the type of companies that we're interested in doing. Um, opportunities that we have, you can see on the bottom left, uh, information technology. 
Pat Barkey just released a, 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 a news release this morning. So thank you guys for providing me information, uh, topic, predicting that the high tech sector is gonna grow eight to, times fast, eight to 10 times faster than any other sector in Montana. Those are important things for us to understand and monitor. So those are the kind of the core areas of businesses that we're looking to attract to our community. We look at what are the best fit and these are the companies that we're interested in. <laughs> Um, would I have an hour? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how do we do it? We really accomplish it by strategic planning. Our very first guide on the left, what is it called? Best place project. I'm glad we could tie this in. Sense of place, that's what we've always been about. And then we have a strategic plan that we use to, to accomplish our goals, to, to do outline how are we doing those previous slides. And these are the questions that I really want to get to right now, just very briefly for you to think about for the rest of, of this afternoon's conversation. Um, we'll, we'll skip that one. It's really, I thought there was another slide in there. Sorry, we'll go back. We like to ask questions. We need to know these things. So we start with where are we now? Where are we as a community? And we ask, where do we wanna go? How do we get there? That's what happened with the Best Place Project. We knew where we were. We wanted to know how do we get here. And that's what developed our strategic initiatives. We also are, are very lucky that we have responsive local elected officials that, that help us make these decisions. Missoula County has been integral in, in the development of the Bonner Industrial Site by the creation of a, a TIF district. Uh, the city of Missoula in their broadband work, they looked at some of the things the providers were saying, our permitting fee for us to move broadband to, to a business is unreasonable. So the city council changed the fees for that to make it uh, happen. So our policies have to be able to align with, with our priorities. The other two quick questions we have, what's, gonna, what's it gonna take to get us there? And in our case, it was the creation of an organization dedicated to economic development. There's a lot of things that we actually don't do. We only really do those three things. Um, quality of life is extremely important to us and it's extremely important to our success. That's not what we do. We have other entities that, that do that. Um, and then the final question that we really think about is how will we know it when we get there? <coughs> we had a goal, but 2015 is different than 2011 when we were created. And so we have to always continue to change and expand. Um, I think we're gonna hear a lot of conversation in coming months and years about workforce development. There are some communities that I've worked for and with that they don't do, they don't, they don't do, that's not very good English. It's okay. <laughs> they have no business attraction strategies. All they do is workforce attraction. We already saw on a previous slide job companies are following the, the talent and that's what we need to concentrate on here developing the talent and that was will bring the companies here so with that uh, my last slide I said is economic growth is economic development that's the outcome of economic development is economic growth so thank you Nick thank you It's, uh, it's always nice to see you up here, James. And you're going to embark on your next five years, right? I mean, you, you well, came here, you had a vision, so. you've got metrics. When is the uh, breakfast, your annual breakfast meeting, coming right up at the end of next February? Wednesday. Out at Neptune? At Neptune. All right, that's great. All right. Learn from the past, plan for the future, and imagine. And if you don't plan for the future, you're like a ship with a great sail. But that sail will just blow that ship wherever the wind happens to blow because you don't have a rudder to steer by. Right? And so what John and Laval and James have done is to give you a sneak preview of where this community is heading, who's holding the rudder, and where that ship is being steered. And you still have opportunities to be involved in the growth policy, and you have opportunities to help guide where Missoula Economic Partnership is going. One of the things we all want to do is to control our own destiny. And our destiny is controlled sometimes by the opportunities that come to us. Oftentimes opportunities are missed. And why are opportunities missed? Because luck happens when preparedness meets opportunity. 
That's when luck happens, when preparedness meets opportunity. Now, some of the opportunities that are on our radar screen that we're going to talk about today and focus on include, thank you very much, Megan. Adam, it's nice to see you out there. I thought the city council was over there, but you got them spread all up through the room here. So open space could be in the future. We may be looking at another open space bond issue. Could be a $9 million bond issue. And there's some other statistics there that you have on the worksheets on the table that you can look at. We're looking at a library expansion. The library expansion could also be somewhere around $25 million. You've got footnotes on your worksheets in front of you that talk about the sources, uh, where we got these numbers from media and from interviews. We've got smart schools 2020 for the high schools. Could be $66 million. And they just did a poll uh, in the community uh, to gauge how they might set their dollars in terms of the needs for our high schools. And then Smart Schools 2020, that's the elementary bond issue for somewhere it could be around $96 million. Amazing opportunities. And remember, we just passed the parks and uh, trail bond issue, I think for 42, I think I said 43 earlier. Um, there's some items there that let you know what kind of taxes you'd pay on a residential home uh, or a business. You can do the math in your own head, if you would. But here's, I want to show you one slide that came out of the uh, study that the school district did. And take a good look at that. So the one on the, to my right, to your left, is local property taxes. 45% of the people in the community thought local property taxes were too high. Only 45% thought that. School property taxes, which was the focus of the survey, only 26% of the people in the community thought that school taxes were too high. I don't think any of that's too surprising for Missoula. The reason it's a great place, the reason we're in the top one, two, three, four, five, and six that we talked about earlier is because we do learn from the past, we do plan for the future, and we do have preparedness when we meet opportunity. Now, of those opportunities, and that's just a few of them, we talked about more earlier in the presentation, there is the ability to finance opportunities. Right? So what I'd like to do is introduce Pat Barkey, who's the director of the Bureau of Business and Economic Research. He's going to talk to us a little about property taxes. He's a little frazzled. Be kind to him. He has been across the state, back and forth, doing the economic outlook seminars on energy, right? Just got back from Kalispell, did that last week, and you're off to Bozeman right after this, correct? So he's on loan to us from the University of Montana. Pat's the director of the Bureau of Business and Economic Research. He became the director in July of 2008 after serving as the director of healthcare research uh, since April of 2007. He's been involved with economic forecasting and healthcare policy research for 24 years, both in the private and public sector. He served previously as director of the Bureau of Business Research at Ball State University in Indiana for 14 years, overseeing the, and participating in a wide variety of projects in labor market research, state and regional economic policy issues. He attended the University of Michigan, receiving a BA in 79 and a PhD in 1986. Mr. Pat Barkey. Thanks, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to uh, share with you some information about the uh, capacity of the community to support our wish list. So um, let me just jump right in and say that the, um, the focus of these remarks is going to be about the property tax. And the reason is because the property tax, collectively speaking, for all local governments in Montana, makes up about 97% of all taxes collected from own source. So uh, about $1.1 billion in the 2012 uh, with a very tiny slice of other tax revenues, the uh, remaining share made up for, for user fees and, and, uh, and revenues from services. So the property tax is, is really what I want to talk about because that's, that's what pays for a lot of the things that we value. And in order to talk about the property tax, I have to do something that everybody hates, which is go back to school. Um, and to try to understand the property tax, I'm going to deliver a few remarks about how it works. They're slightly simplified. There are asterisks and footnotes on almost everything I say. I'll try to keep those out of the discussion just to keep a little bit more clarity and say that we want to try to understand how the property tax works and how we stack up and, and what kind of uh, opportunities and what kind of challenges are presented. So to start out with, we have to uh, go back to school here for just a moment. There's a concept in property taxes known as taxable value. All right. 
which is derived from something which most of us know about, which is appraised value, all right, which uh, for commercial and uh, residential property is supposed to be related to the price you could get if you sold your facility. And then there's something uh, subtracted from that called the exemption amount, which is sometimes called the homestead exemption, which is set by the legislature currently at about 44% of appraised value. So that's, uh, that beast is then multiplied by something called a tax rate, uh, which is a number that comes out of the legislature, which has changed from time to time as we go through the appraisal cycle. So we start with this idea of taxable value. It's clearly not the value of your property, but it's based on the value of your property. And then the rest of property taxes is just more arithmetic. It's very simple. You take that taxable value of property and you multiply it times something, which is called a mill. It's sometimes simply called mills. This is the mill levy. It is a number which indicates the tax effort, broadly speaking, of your particular community. So just to give you a quick example, and then we'll be done with the lecture part of this program. Uh, if you had a $300,000 home in Missoula, I'm still trying to figure out where to find a $200,000 one. Ruth is um, <laughs> If you had a $300,000 home in Missoula, then we compute your taxable value by subtracting this 44% from your $300,000 appraised value, multiplying it times this 2.63%. So your taxable value is about $4,400. And then to actually compute your property tax bill, we would take your mill rate, which in Missoula was 765. So we take roughly three quarters of that $4,400 and your property tax bill would be computed this way. So that, that 765 is the, is the mill rate in the historical data for uh, someone who lives in the city of Missoula. So what, what, what's that number? Where, where, where did that come from? Well, first off, let's remember that that's, your mill rate then is related to the size of your tax bill, very clearly, all right? So where does that come from? Well, in Missoula, you get your, your, as in every community in Montana, you're, you're presented with a property tax bill and ultimately a mill rate, which is a composite of all the overlapping local governments that uh, use the property tax as one of their sources of revenue. So, in, in Missoula, that 765, well, 241 of those mills would be the city rate. Then you would have the county rate as paid by a city resident, another 145 mills. Then you have the general education mills, which are 354 in this, for this year. And then the university system has a little tiny square of statewide, six mills. And finally, there's special districts, 20. Now, nah, there's asterisks and footnotes on all this, but this is, this is, how it goes, this is, this is roughly speaking the mill rate. So this is, this is the tax effort of the community as a whole as seen through the eyes of a Missoula taxpayer, be they a business or be they a residence. Well, now is where you get interesting. I'm going to start quoting some results of uh, a study that was done by Professor Doug Young at Montana State, some of which is summarized in the uh, Montana Business Quarterly you may have picked up uh, in your uh, slide. So let's, let's talk about where Missoula is. All right, now on a mill rate comparison, if you look across these seven largest communities, you can see that Missoula's mill rate is among the highest. I say among the highest, it shows up as highest in this graph, but it turns out there's some other things that have to be added to property. To, there are some property taxes that are not based on an assessed value. They're based on other things like uh, frontage and things like that. That changes this comparison just a little bit so let me just say that if you look at where we are right now in terms of mill rates, Missoula is around the highest of the major communities across the state. Uh, so the question is, why is that? Why, why, why are we high? Well, that's, we, you know, that's, there's, arithmetically we can look at that and we can also look at it from the point of view of, uh, of, uh, of our own community preferences. So the first thing is, well, one reason why our mill rates are, are high, as described in the Young study, is that depending on exactly how you measure it, uh, we, like, we spend more money, comparatively speaking, than some other Montana communities. So how do we measure that? Well, first, let's start from the point of view of the cities. And what this graph is trying to show you is trying to take collectively all of the budgets under control, in this case, the city of Missoula, the city of Kalispell, and so forth. You can read the other communities there 
Butte is left out because it's a county city combination, so it's not comparable. So if you look at city spending per person, all right, and that's a, that's a number which is up and down. It's got some irregularity to it. So let's take a three-year average and take it spending per person. You can see that one reason why our taxes are, our, our mill rates are a little high here is because we have our spending ranks among the higher from the point of view of the city, all right? That's even more uh, dramatic when you look at counties. So now I'm gonna do, by the way, let me back up here for a second. So here what I do is I do per person. That's per person living in the city limits. So city spending is divided by city population, all right? That's the per person spending. You can see the ranking in terms of how those are across, you see there's considerable variability. When you look at the county, you're doing the same thing, but you're looking at different budgets, excuse me, and you're looking at a different population. So the same idea, larger population, different set of budgets, but here Missoula is, Missoula County as a whole, uh, spends uh, in, this, in this group of, of counties the highest of any county of the urban counties across the state. So we have higher mill rates because we have higher spending, but that's not all there is to it. Mill rates are levied against collectively all of the property that's subject to tax within the jurisdictions we're looking at. So another reason why our mill rates are a little high here is because our tax base is comparatively speaking a little low. Now this graph takes a little explanation. But first off, by tax base I mean just that. The, the value of property subject to tax. But since I have communities of different size here, what I'm going to do is measure that slightly different way. So I'm going to ask the question, in each of these communities, in this case cities across Montana, how many dollars would be raised if I increased taxes by one mil? All right? And since these communities are different size, I'm going to say per person. So per person in each of these differently sized communities, how much extra tax revenue would be generated by an increase in one mil in the mill rate? And so what happens here is the lower the number you get here, all right, the less effective, in other words, the, the smaller is your base on a per capita basis. So what you see is you look at Missoula raises $1.61 per person in the city by raising mills by one. Uh, you can see Helm is higher than that, Bozeman's higher than that, Great Falls is less than that. So Missoula is a little bit towards the middle of the pack in terms of the city tax base by this measure. The county shows up even uh, a little bit less, uh, a little bit more behind. You can see that in Missoula when you raise uh, mill rates by one per person in the county, you're, you're raising significantly less money than you would, for example, in this case, the two highest ones would be Flathead and Gallatin. That's a measure of the size and also the composition of the tax base. One of the things summarized in the, uh, the Doug Young study, and I'll give you the site when I'm done, is the fact that Missoula has comparatively less industrial property than some other communities across the state. So what does that mean? That means in order to raise more money, you have to have a higher mill rate because your base is not as large. So that's, that's where we're going. That's how the arithmetic works out. Let's talk a little bit about what's happened over time. So it's interesting to take a look at how these mill rates have changed as you go forward through the decades. And what the Young study does, it takes a look at the mill rates, not, not the appraised value, none of those other measures, but simply the mill rate, that factor, which is multiplied times your taxable value to determine your property tax bill. If you look at those mill rates in here, there's a lot of detail in the study. I'm going to skim over that. Uh, I'm not going to present city and county separately for reasons of time. But if you look across these communities, you can see that there's, there's two stories here. One is that these mill rates have increased across the state. They've increased by a lot, in many cases doubling or more than doubling. That's not inflation. That is at least in part uh, higher tax rates. Oh, there's a footnote on that I'll tell you in a minute. The other story here is to say that Missoula's mill rate being highest in the state or near the highest in the state is not a new story. We've been that way for a while. I mean, and that's, that's, that's a measure, again, of a lot of things. But this is how the numbers work out. So you can see that the mill rates have gone up by quite a bit 
One of the reasons for that, by the way, is, as described in the Young study, is the fact that there's been a lot of changes in the legislature. The homestead exemption has been raised. The tax rate has been messed around with. So communities have compensated somewhat by raising mill rates. So that increase overstates the actual increase in taxes. But let me show you something else, and I think this is one of the most important slides in this presentation. Unfortunately, it's one of the most complicated. And that's to take a look at what's happened to the tax base. Now, I put up this measure before at a point in time, and that's a measure of how much an extra mill would raise in revenue per person in each community. Now I'm going to change that. I'm going to compare how it was in the 90s to where it is most recently. And whenever you look at the change in a dollar figure over that long of a period of time, you have to correct for inflation. All right? So these are inflation corrected, so-called real dollars. And you can see that in every community except Bozeman, when you increase a mill, you get less bang for the buck, so to speak. So one way of saying that is the, the growth in tax base in most communities, not all, but in most communities shown here, has not quite kept up with the rate of inflation. All right? Now, that's both because of what's happening in the economy all right, and what's happening in law, which has to do with how much the legislature uh, the various exemptions and so forth that affect taxes. So what's going on here? We have, we have uh, declining tax base, raising mill rates. The upshot is that what's, what's the final story on property taxes? And this is, this is as close as we can come to the final story. And that's what's happening to property taxes per person. Um, again, you, I, you come along with me very nicely. No, no, no fruit has been thrown so far. So this, this puts it all together and asks the question, what's going on with property taxes? Are they going up or are they going down? Well, on a per capita basis, you can see, looking at the 90s versus now, so that's quite a period of time, a 20-year period, that taxes per person measured in dollars also corrected for inflation because I'm taking a 20-year uh, growth. You can see that tax rates, excuse me, taxes paid uh, in most communities, including Missoula, across the state have, have risen. All right, have they risen more than we want to pay? Well, I don't know, you know, a lot of these taxes are come out of, uh, from, from our democratic process, so I, I have no comment to make on that whatsoever. Simply to say that those taxes have risen, the communities are more prosperous, can they afford to pay it? These are all questions that are, are essentially asking uh, people for opinion, but just in terms of measuring it, you can see that there's been you know, some, some growth in, in property taxes and, and some of the other things. So what are my conclusions? Well, my conclusions is property tax burdens are going up. It's not just a myth. It's, you're seeing it happen everywhere. Uh, property taxes pay for things we value, and those things have bills, and, and we pay them. I think another thing in terms of Missoula, I think uh, we punch a little bit above our weight in terms of spending, a little bit below our weight in terms of tax base. I think that comes out of the data. Uh, I think there's, that's the way, uh, I don't know if that's that different today than it was 20 years ago, uh, but that's certainly the way it is today. And I would simply say, as the most apolitical comment I can possibly offer on a politically touchy subject, that growth in tax base would certainly increase the community's capacity to pay for new spending, uh, <coughs> as would other things. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. There's no such thing as a free lunch. You guys paid for lunch today. Remember all those things that Missoula is, from number one down to number six, and what makes us great. So out in the audience, we have past leaders. I'm not going to point them out, but I want to thank each and every one of you past leaders, because you got us here. You got us where we're at and got us on all those lists comparatively so that other people would notice us and we would really enjoy what we have here in Missoula. For those of you who are current leaders in the community, you face one heck of a challenge. Let's talk about it for just a second. So pre-recession, our tax base was growing around mm, five, six percent a year, okay? And that allowed local governments to some extent to be able to keep up with demand for services or to keep services at the same rate. During the recession, the growth in the tax base has been much less, maybe one, maybe two percent. 
in Missoula County, it might have actually dipped below the positive line for a year or two in there. But meanwhile, these leaders, the city and the county, have been able to keep a level of service for all of us in terms of what we're trying to do. Now, a while back when John Engen was facing head-on uh, the issues associated with justice in our community and justice for all, he was proposing a maintenance district, a public safety, um, I'll just call it the public safety um, district. You sent ballots out to taxpayers. You were going to put that on an election, Mr. Mayor. You decided that that would be better than a bond issue approach. And now you're faced with the challenge of what to do and how to finance that very real need in our community that we have to address. And so your shoulders are broad, and I think all of us should really appreciate what you're doing there. But here's the bottom line. You can reappraise property till the cows come home. In the state of Montana, you're not going to gain any significant tax base from reappraisal. The only way we can increase our tax base is through new construction. The only way we can increase our tax base is through new construction. So what are our redevelopment districts in the city of Missoula, what do they promote? They provide incentives, incentives for demolition, incentives for capital facilities, and incentives for new businesses. And last year at the state of Missoula, we talked about that. So Chris and Ellen, thank you very much for all you do there. James Grunke, in terms of the economic partnership and the people in this room that support you and will continue to support you in the coming next five years as you develop your goals and objectives, will help us increase that tax base. It's part of our future. It's part of where we need to be and how we need to grow. So I would like to give all of our elected officials who do not have a potpourri of a wide number of revenue resources to choose from. There's no local option taxes here. There's no sales taxes here, right? They primarily rely on the property tax, what they have to do, and they do a damn good job. So let's give a round of applause to our local elected officials. All right, we have talked about community goals. We've talked about opportunities that are going to be facing us in the near future. We've talked about uh, resources associated with that. You boil down complicated economics and property tax into an understandable fashion, Patrick, and we really appreciate that. Now, before we break into the tables to talk about what you need more information on in more forums, do you have any questions for our panelists? Anybody with any questions? Jean. To Mr. Barkey, uh, the change in the value of money in Missoula County and the city, have, at least in the county portion, would have to do with closing two mills too, right? So now we share, uh, we spread that cost over fewer people, less income. Right. I, I don't think I actually showed the county uh, right. that's, that's in the report, which is cited in the MBQ article. Okay. Correct. Yes, uh, it's both economic and legal factors, but economic is the value of base, and legal is the legislative decision on, on, on how much of it is subject to tax. Other questions? Look at that audience, the mildly curious, the oddly curious, and there's no questions. <laughs> Yeah, Bob Jaffe. Um, on the the survey about uh, the surveys that were done about place making. Thanks. Is, is it on? All right. The survey is about place making. I was curious about where those were done, and and there are places that I consider kind of like non places that I would never want to live in. But I imagine the people that live there would answer similarly if they live here because they like the quality of life. They call it chain stores and things like that that they can go to. But what, so I'm curious, is if that's sort of a self-selecting, like it's nice to hear validation of the policies that we've pursued, but I'm curious how sort of self-selecting the responses are. And right. whether or not when you do those surveys in like say the Tri-Cities over Washington, like you get the same answer. <laughs> Not, not Washington, it wasn't in our survey area, but yeah, to answer your question, it was self-selecting. And one of the things for transparency here is that though we had a, a fairly large sample size, nearly 500 individual responses on both of those surveys, which is significant, 
it, it's not a scientifically valid survey. So there are some metrics and some steps that you, you have to take, which is beyond my capacity to do. But the two companies that we work with said, you know, this is, it's gonna be a self-selecting survey. You send the survey out to people and they take it or not. So I'd imagine in terms of, you know, your comment about whether or not people are living places because they like the chain stores, that's quite possible. And so that's why we've got some of these other um, uh, studies we've done that really help to drill down on that. And I would say too that the work is undone. You know a little bit about these sort of high level principles. I think what, where we want to go is let's look at specific communities. Let's look at Missoula. Let's look at some places across the West and understand what is it about this particular place that people are valuing. And what is it at that very, you know, weed level that, that people are, are interested in. Does that help? Yeah, I guess I'm not totally sure what I'm even asking. You know, if I look at look at what are we trying to attract, and then you know, like Nick said, we you know we want to increase construction, increase our tax base. Um, so we want to create a community that is going to draw people, we're going to do those things. Um, the people who come to Missoula come here because they like the things we're doing in Missoula. I imagine people that come to you know, these other places. There today, like those things, which you know. So, what are what are it's almost like when I look from the other side? So, people who are going to build new stuff and spend more money, how do we what are the things that bring them in? I'll respond really quickly to that. I think that's your opportunity to work with Laval and her team to engage in your growth policy update that's happening right now because it's your opportunity to set that table. And I, I mean, I don't have the answer for you, you probably collectively do. I don't. Sure. Any other questions? <clears throat> yeah, Brent Campbell. So if we're relying on our new industry, technology, to grow our economy, and that technology does not really rely on bricks and mortars, as we know. A lot of it's you know, happening at Brick Espresso and in, in sort of in the ether. Are we? strategically in the wrong place with our property taxes for reliance on our communities when essentially other parts of our economy are growing. Who, who would like to answer that question? <laughs> James? I will say one thing on that. We, we've worked recently with a, a company um, that would be a, a large data center. And data centers, while they're not in very large in employment, they're very, very large in tax base. And the personal property tax on their equipment, which would have been millions of dollars of equipment in this data center, made Montana um, not competitive. And so they will not locate in Missoula. In Missoula. So there are absolutely the <coughs> impacts uh, that the property tax does have on business decisions. Anybody else want to take a shot at that? Huh? Well, you attract with growth, right? So, uh, you know, what, what it's true that service businesses don't have the capital stock, to use economics jargon, as uh, you know, smokestack industries, uh, but they create plenty of demand for all kinds of things that, uh, that require capital investment. So, uh, you know, our studies indicate that they, they, have, they can have a very potent effect on the tax base, even if they they themselves are big taxpayers. So one of the things that Missoula County just did, they did a targeted economic development district out at Bonner, and Harris Manufacturing just built a huge facility out there, and they got plans for further expansion, and I think what's going on at Bonner is pretty exciting also. But I don't know if that got to the heart of your question, but any other questions? All right, now you get to do your table work. So uh, Sam Sill, why don't you come up here with me just for a second? Sam is my guiding light. So look around on your tables, you got a worksheet. And that worksheet should be similar to the spreadsheet I showed you. It talks about the opportunities that are out there. What I'd like each table to do is, as a group, engage in a discussion about each of those opportunities and come to a consensus on which ones you would like additional information. On which ones you would like additional information, and from there, the Chamber of Commerce will host some uh, forums 
Behind Sam on this banner, it says, the Missoula Chamber of Commerce, business engaging community. That's exactly what we're doing. Three years ago, we talked to you about the Confederated Salish Kootenai Water Compact. We talked to you about combined appropriations and water rights. Today, it's on the front page of the newspaper. So we're trying to be out in front of things. Any special instructions for the group, Sam? Uh, none other than besides um, reporting as we go around, if you have individual thoughts or comments, please leave them on the uh, forums that we have provided. All right, everybody, can I have your attention up front, please? Get you out of here so you can make some money. All right, we're going to start over in the corner. Just give us, give us the ones that you'd like more information on. Your engineers, be careful. Be nice to them, Sam. Engineers and the controllers. There you go. Debit's left, credit's right. <laughs> uh, I think our consensus is the uh, need for broad broadband support and uh, building the infrastructure for more broadband support for uh, entrepreneurs or companies to relocate here and uh, associated with that, we would assume that it would be a uh, pretty highly educated type of uh, uh, clientele, okay. so they would bring in, uh, they would require uh, quality education, so the uh, support for the smart schools. Super. Okay. Schools and broadband. Broadband and schools. Thank you very much. Who else wants to talk to us about what your table came up with? Yeah, Sam, we got a we had a volunteer right up here. Come on up, Kimberly. Thank you. Um, we discussed, I think, two primary things, which is university-based talent. As we move from manufacturing-based economy and timber industry into an education technology-based industry, we have the university play some of that. Um, probably uh, transportation logistics, you know, for manufacturing are kind of you know in the middle of a dark spot. In the middle of the country, and how does that you know, impact people's ability to manufacture? Um, and then, you know, maybe a conversation about sales tax versus property tax. I know that's one that doesn't get much traction at the state or legislature, but you know, considering one of our main industries is transport or tourism, um, you know, how does that continue to? Yeah. Think, the conversation? To think about sales tax, we have to figure somebody to lay on the ground so the bus can drive over them to get traction. And yes. Nobody wants to do that. So it's a good point, though. But the old saying that. Uh, Every politician knows what to do. It's just sometimes they don't always do it once they get there. And that's right. There, but yeah. it's but they're all tough deal. Right? We have no politicians in Missoula. They're all states. Absolutely. So, all right. Who else wants to report? Anybody else? Brave table out there. David. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. Um, I'm relatively new to the community, and uh, like very new. Um, I guess the question that I had when I looked at the list, and, and uh, my question was around the smart schools, and I was wondering what the definition of the smart school was, and I guess I was informed that, yes, it's about the computer, whiteboards, and the computer, and, and bringing the schools up to a technology standard so that each and every child could have you know, a laptop to do their, their work and try to move the, away from the books. But I guess I was surprised to learn that um, the schools themselves are, are crumbling and imploding unto themselves. So it almost, it, it, from this table, it sounded like it wasn't just putting the technology in, it was actually doing the basic repairs so that these things won't fall unto themselves. And it, as John said earlier, this is a critical component uh, for, your, for your strategy moving forward. So your choice at that table would be more information on the schools. <clears throat> Probably with high, high school and grade school. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other brave table want to step forward with it? Yeah, Mark. Over here, Kimberly. Mr. Galon. Oh, Sam. So uh, much. You know, we, we appreciate the, the Amenities Act property and the art culture and everything that makes OS great. But we would like to um, incorporate into growth policy um, in the entitlement process, make it friendly and predictable for businesses that do come in. I think a lot of times they bypass. Uh, just because it isn't straightforward and laid out in some of the industry you're trying to track. Okay, thanks, Mark. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right. 
We're going to mix water, hydrology, and the law here. Uh, thanks, Nick. Um, one, one of the discussions that bubbled out of our table was for information that uh, we'd like to have on these bond, potential bond issues is what other bond burdens are headed our way. Um, in other words, like what's, what's a total long-term financial plan in terms of asset investments so that um, uh, investments could be and spending could be prioritized knowing the future, you know, what's planned for the future. That's great. And that's kind of the purpose of today's uh, whole meeting, Ross, is to try to see everything that we can see on the horizon and then uh, get additional information. So I appreciate that. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yes, Stacy Rye. Um, we kind of talked about the also the uh, similar to the table over here about the safe schools, elementary and high school. And I think one of the questions we had was that uh, informational presentation might be helpful with is uh, if it's just bricks and mortar, how does that get towards better education for the kids in those classrooms as opposed to more teachers or um, different technology or something like that? So we kind of wanted to know how the physical uh, facilities themselves lend themselves to a better education. I think one of the questions that I'll just add when this table back here was talking was, in addition to knowing what's kind of coming at us in terms of uh, bonds, I would be curious to know what's going offline. So I can remember passing bonds in 1995, 96, um, so on and so forth, and I would be interested to know how, when, when are they falling off of our tax rolls so that we can you know, possibly replace them with some of these things that we so desperately need? That's a, that's a great question, Stacy. We actually have that information, and I think it would be uh, another great topic from the ones that we've mentioned. It's a really good question. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yes. Bill Boucher. <laughs> it's your it's your sparkling personality, Mr. Dean. Yeah. Um, well, you got your four opportunities on there, and uh, open space. You know, I love it. Uh, but how much do we need? And I guess uh, how much do we have? I really don't know. But I think a better tactic on that might be gifting and conservation easements or some other tax benefits for getting that. So I think we have quite a bit of it now, so informationally maybe we need to know a little bit more about that. On the library, we, uh, I mean, I think there is a real need there. I don't know, I hear of all these people that use the library and it's been there a long time, and so I suspect that we need to know a lot more about that and there is a big need there. And then on the smart schools, it looks like a pretty big ticket to all of us. And uh, I'm not sure, I've seen a little bit on TV about that of the classroom restructure group talking, thinking rather than individual tests or something. So uh, I think we need to know a lot more about that and the cost. And I think you better pick your priorities here because you know, and space them or something because you might get some or none. So I think you better be careful in, in what you pick and make sure you've got a lot of information out there and which is the highest need. Thank That's you. great. That's, that'll be the purpose of the forums. Thank you, Bill. And here's my lawyer. He has a few things to say, too. You know, uh, <laughs> back, back at that table is Bill Boucher and John Coffey, and they really are community builders and founders at the, the highest level in the zoo. Nice to have you gentlemen here. Thanks for expressing your opinions, but which you've never been shy of. <laughs> Anybody else? All right, we'll call it a day. So, you are the best community out there. You are the best people out there with the best leaders out there. We are your Chamber of Commerce and we are a business engaging community. Have a profitable afternoon and thank you very much all of our panelists and everybody who attended today.